Now we come to our third guest, uh, Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who is a professor of law at Yale University and specializing in teaching uh, matters about the United Nations. Dr. Lemkin is the man who created the word genocide and really uh, has fought this thing from long, long ago. Uh, Dr. Lemkin, could you give us a little background on how you came to be interested in this genocide fight originally? Gladly, Mr. Howe. Uh, it leads me very far back to my childhood. Everybody has sentimental memories from childhood, and everybody has a book he loved most. One of my inspirations in this field was a book by Sienkiewicz, Quo Vadis, which described the terrible sufferings of early Christians. Later on, I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians, and uh, after the Armenians uh, got a very rough deal at the Versailles Conference because uh, the criminals who were guilty of genocide were not punished. You know that they've organized a organization, a terroristic organization, which took justice in their own hands. The trial of pa Talat Pasha in 1921 in Berlin uh, is very instructive. Uh, a man uh, uh, whose mother was killed in the in genocide case of uh, killed Talat Pasha. And he told to the court that he did it because his mother came in, in his sleep and incited him many times. Uh, here is a murder of, of your mother, you don't do a thing about it. And uh, so he committed a crime. So you see, uh, as a lawyer, I thought that uh, a crime should not be uh, punished by the victims, but should be punished by court, by international law. And you took it up uh, then again when Hitler came to power in Germany, didn't Correct, you? Correct, in 1933, and there was not a big case of genocide yet who, which uh, uh, interested me, a big case in Near East, and I would like to mention the country. There are two cases in 1933, and then I said uh, to myself, now being a lawyer, I'm going to do something about it. And I have submitted a draft convention uh, to a committee of a conference of legal experts, which were connected with the League of Nations. And however, uh, no action was taken. And then, however, but Hitler took action, and that precipitated conscience of the world to do something about it. You had to wait till the United Nations was established to get the action that has finally resulted, didn't you? I would say partially something was done about it in London when I was an advisor to into the American prosecutor and we wrote in the genocide charge in, in the Nuremberg indictment. Unfortunately, the court did uh, took a restricted rather stand on genocide and uh, punished on the crimes committed in connection with war. So, uh, as far as genocide committed in time of peace, uh, as strange as it might seem, it was still a lawful thing. And therefore, you, I tried to interest the United Nations, and I have approached three delegations, delegation of Cuba, Panama, and India, sponsored the resolution, and then we start the ball rolling. Well, that brings us to the United Nations and to Dr. Cano, who is an official of the United Nations. I think some people who watch this program may think that the United Nations officials are just bureaucrats sitting back at desks. Dr. Kenner, won't you disillusionize us about that and tell how you got to be interested in genocide? It's uh, not a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty grim story, I know. Uh, the answer is very simple. You know that I am of Czechoslovak origin. And I think the name of Lidice is very well known to every American. Yes. And so you see that if Hitler had won the war, so not only the Jews, but surely all the Czechoslovak and all the Polish people would have become victims of genocide. And you, during the war yourself, were uh, in the French underground, is that right? Uh, yes, because I managed to escape from Czechoslovakia, but I could not escape from France, so I had to live there under German occupation, and of course I work, worked for the right cause in the underground. Well, now I'd like to get around to the United States, because I think a lot of American listeners want to know uh, some things about this convention, which I think uh, Congressman Seller can probably answer better than anyone. Uh, does this convention, Congressman Sella, become binding as soon as it's ratified, uh, become, become binding upon us? Well, there's a provision in the uh, convention that uh, asks the contracting parties uh, to um, implement 
uh, said convention uh, to provide effective penalties for persons guilty of genocide or any other, other acts enumerated in the convention. Uh, there would be a moral obligation on the part of the United States uh, to pass legislation once it ratifies a yes. treaty uh, to implement it. And is there any uh, American tradition that supports uh, endorsing such a uh, proclamation, declaration as this? Oh, I, there, there undoubtedly is sufficient tradition for that, uh, for the ratification of that convention. This country was built up by men and women who fled religious persecution in Europe. Killing and torturing members of religious groups was not new at that time in Europe. Uh, when we, when we, when the founding fathers gave us our constitution, uh, that is the reason why the American people and the American leaders always disapproved of barbarities of the sort that just has just been flashed to the uh, uh, television audience on the screen. Uh, President Wilson, a great Democratic leader tried to save the Armenian people from genocide during the First World War and shortly thereafter. The American people, without uh, distinction of party affiliation, have poured, poured forth millions to help victims of genocide, both after the First World War and after the Second World War, and also at the beginning of the century. We were at the receiving end uh, with reference to the evils of genocide. We have to pay the piper, and therefore I would think that we should pass this uh, international statute, ratify it, so as to prevent a recurrence of a genocide. Well, now let's I know also, uh, Mr. Howe, that President Truman has uh, ratified, uh, President Truman has embraced uh, the declaration of genocide. Well, let, let's, let's, uh, let me ask you one perfectly blunt question, if I may. How do you think some of the Southern uh, uh, Democrats are going to feel about this? Will they feel that this is going to be used uh, as another weapon against lynching and the treatment of Negroes in the South and all that, that foreigners will come meddling into their affairs? Well, attempts will be made to uh, give them that impression, but as I read the convention and the history of the convention, uh, there is no intention uh, to make, for example, lynching a crime of genocide. Uh, genocide is uh, that which is directed against uh, a people. Extermination uh, an group, of the whole people, isn't uh, that it? In whole or in part, yes. uh, but that is not uh, involved in the, uh, in the crime of lynching. And uh, I hope that the uh, Southern senators and the Southern members of the House uh, will get uh, sufficient enlightenment on that score. How about the American Bar Association? They've been uh, uh, urging us to go a bit slow. Uh, what's, what's the angle on that? Why are they taking that attitude? Well, I'm not sufficiently clear in mind as to the, what's underlying the American Bar Association's uh, attitude. I don't think they say uh, uh, dogmatic, uh, dogmatically that they're opposed to the convention. They asked for a mature reflection and an extended time for study. Now, that may be a dodge and a stall, I don't know, and it may be a facade to cover uh, absolute opposition. Uh, but uh, I, if that is the case, it is just the old uh, strain of isolationism uh, that's uh, running through the confines of the Bar Association. Do you think that this convention should have more teeth in it than it has in its present form? I think the convention has, uh, has a good deal of teeth in it, uh, but uh, I uh, still think that it would be well for uh, the United States, once it ratifies it, or once other nations ratify it, uh, to adopt implementing statutes. How do you feel about that, uh, Professor Lemkin, about the teeth in the convention? Do you feel that it's uh, strong enough now in its present form? I would say it's strong enough. A uh, international treaty must be made in such a way it's acceptable to the entire world. Uh, it's not unilateral uh, business. So uh, 57 nations have transacted. And you have uh, a number of very important provisions, like the uh, provision of, about extradition, the provision about the uh, obligation to punish uh, by domestic courts, and then the very essential provision uh, of uh, of supervising the implementation of the convention by the World Court of Justice in The Hague. And now the authors of the convention didn't want to run into new institutions, they wanted to use existing institutions, familiar to the entire world, as to, so as to make the acceptance of the convention more easy. Well now, uh, Dr. Kano, uh, you were there when the convention was finally uh, passed 55 to nothing. Will you just say a little about the significance of that extraordinary vote? I was very much gratified that on this important question, 
unanimity was obtained in the Paris Assembly and that there was no East-West division. And among the first 21 signatories, you have not only the United States, but you have, for instance, Yugoslavia. So you see, it was really the unanimous wish of the Assembly. And uh, Representative Sell, I think we're going to have a north-south division on this. In the well, I hope there'll be none. As I said before, if this matter is properly debated and uh, a real intelligence is brought to bear upon the subject, uh, there should be no uh, rift. And uh, I do hope for an overwhelming vote uh, in the, both houses if the uh, agreement method is used or in the uh, Senate if the treaty method. Thanks very much uh, to all our three guests, Dr. Lemkin, Dr. Cano, and Representative Seller, for taking part in this discussion of the problems of genocide.